a video that was made um, by the our Ret our better world the mm -hmm. their like filmmakers and they have uh, documented a bit of Parasu and the journey and I think it's a mm -hmm. it's a good video to show uh, the students and I hope they like it and I hope it's useful for them yeah perfect perfect yep uh, okay Ivan let everybody in and then remove the uh, what do you call this the, uh, the waiting room yeah the waiting room okay okay go ahead and so then, I'll let everyone in now. Yeah, and then I'm gonna live stream this, Fazana. Once I live stream this, we will we will start live stream on Facebook. Here we go. It's all very high tech, Derek. Yes, and you will be doing all this. Isn't I'll bring you up in I'll bring you up in Hatfield. I'll be sleeping. I'll wake you up. Enter description then. And share on my timeline. Go live. And then it's preparing the live stream. It takes a while for the live stream to go in. Ah, okay, Di redirecting to Facebook live page. And we are live on my Facebook. Right, perfect. We are live on my Facebook. Wonderful. Okay, oh, well, Dr. June is here as well. Wonderful. Hi, June. Nice to meet you yesterday. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks Hi. for having me, Derek. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just want to start by saying thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, my name is uh, Derek Ong, and of course, this is being live streamed on Facebook, my Facebook. And um, we are very happy to continue our series on the sustainable and social marketing uh, guest lecture series that I've always done for the past I don't know, this is my third year already. Uh, I'm happy to have Miss uh, um, Fazana to be with us. Uh, Miss Fazana has been living in Malaysia for almost nine years, and uh, she's part of this uh, theater group uh, for the oppressed. Uh, they are called the Parastu Theater since 20, uh, 2017. And she was the lead actress actually in the um, a play called Screaming in Silence, and since then she has acted in different shows by Parastu Theatre. Uh, Fazana uh, has worked as a part-time teacher, teaching children, and she also believes that uh, early education is an important uh, tool for uh, a better world to be created. So uh, we would very much like to hear about Fazana's journey, uh, coming uh, from where she came from, and also how uh, we need to be better in creating a better world. So, Fazana, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Derek. Thank you so much for having me here too. Uh, thank you so much for giving me your time and uh, letting me to come here and uh, talk with you guys. It's uh, such an honor. Uh, well, you have already introduced me. Uh, well, I, I was, I'm still going to do it again. Um, my name is Farzana and I am 19 years old and I've been in Malaysia for uh, almost or more than nine years. Yeah. And I've come here in 2000, 2014 together with my family. And uh, yeah, I've come, yeah, 2014 together with my family here. And since then, since then we have been living here as refugees in Malaysia. And uh, I've studied here in a couple of schools because um, I had to exchange a lot of schools, a lot of refugee schools from here and there because of uh, a lot of family issues we were having and uh, having to settle down in one place. So we were always constantly changing home and changing schools. So it was pretty tough for me to like catch up in my studies a lot of times because 
once we would go to this school and then a few months later we had to change to another school so I didn't get to like fully stay in one school for one year and finish one grade uh, so it was a little bit challenging and 2017 we in 2017 I joined this uh, theater that was formed that was created by my brother-in-law who is Saleh Sepas uh, yeah he is the founder of theater of uh, Paris to theater which is uh, the form of this theater is operas where uh, which is called theater of op operas which is uh, not only audience is being an audience, the audience are also a part of sh the show. They also give solutions. Uh, we always show a problem and then we try to solve it together with the audience. So I I've been uh, acting with uh, Paris Theater since 2017 till now. And I've been the main actor in a few of the shows. And we will be, ha uh, we have, Recently, we did a show um, that was about men mental health, uh, and I played the lead as well in there. And as soon we are planning to have some other shows which are um, based on violence, mental health, uh, uh, work rights, and uh, refugee rights. There, so we basically try to. Uh, the goal of this theater is to remove the gap between the locals and refugees and also to like bring awareness, tell people that this is not the only issue that maybe refugees are facing. Maybe this, there are more people facing this. Like the last show we had was about child marriage, but a lot of people are like, unaware of it and a lot of people are aware of it but doesn't talk about it much or a lot of people think that it's like maybe only refugees problem or only like the certain people's problem but it's something that is happening like around the world like child marriage is something really important to talk about and not a lot of people talk about it or not a lot of people know about it so we take very sometimes very sensitive uh, uh, subjects and talk about it and perform it uh, sometimes we get hate towards it and sometimes people really love it and people love to see more of our work and sometimes it's really learning and some and and it really helps people to uh, with it's really helps people and uh uh since then i have been yeah uh paris to have been my whole life and uh uh because the paris is the only uh refugee theater in malaysia and uh i'm really glad to be a part of it because a lot of youth in malaysia uh a lot of afghan youth a lot of uh, refugee uh youth doesn't get those opportunities to be like to do something they love. And for me to have that as a part of my life, I feel like really grateful about it. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, being here is like, there's a lot of challenges when you're like a, a normal person, you will face lots of challenges. But then when you were given the name of refugee, then your challenges gets twice. Like you will face more challenges here. So um, it was a really tough time, like having to go to schools here because you're basically not allowed to go to local schools here or uh, have a chance of choosing which path you want to go. Like for me, I did finish my uh, high school here, but I didn't get the opportunity to uh, sit for my IGCSC exams because um, first, if I have the IGCSC results, it's gonna take like, it's very expensive for me to have it, but even after I have it, it's still gonna be useless for me because as with the documents I'm holding, they will not let me 
be in the university that I love or pursue what I like. So, so it's still like, I would say like for me at this time, it would be a waste to like sit for the sit for an exam which will lead me in nowhere. Like that's what I feel about it. And that's what I think about it. Like, okay, if I sit for this exam and then it doesn't take me anywhere, so there's no point of it. This is these are the challenges that we mostly like as a refugee youth you face face it and that's why I stopped schooling and I didn't take my IGCSE exam and I straight uh, started working to also support my family support myself as well uh, since then I've been working my first job was uh, at this Korean school. Uh, Korean kindergarten I was teaching kids from three years old to four years old and that's the place where I learned a lot about kids and I learned that that's something that I really enjoy doing and like being around kids teaching kids you know uh, it's really fun and it, it it makes me like you know when you hang out with a group of fun people then you would be like oh my god my life is so much happier and then that's how i feel towards kids like being around kids i feel like oh my god life is actually beautiful <laughs> and um after a while uh COVID hit and a lot of things were going down and this kindergarten ended up uh closing down and me and my older sister we were both working in that kindergarten then we were like okay um we were both jobless for like a year. And then we come out with an idea. Well, in that year, we were like trying to come up with an idea or maybe like a business that we both can do, like somehow earn money, but also to give people also. And we both come up with an idea of like opening a kindergarten for refugee kids um, to also like, uh, because we both have the experience of teaching as an international teacher. Like we've been both been working there for, I, my sister have been working in the Korean kindergarten for almost like six years and I've been working for a year and a half. So we both had the experience of how to teach kids, how to deal with them like in a way that it should be. So we uh, came out with an idea of opening our own kindergarten and teaching kids and we started off with the uh, 10 kids and now we have like 30 kids uh, coming to kindergarten. And that's uh, something, that's a big achievement for both me and my sister, but mostly her because it was like 60% her idea of doing it, but we both did it together. And uh, it's something, um, yeah. And uh, I started working there in the kindergarten with her teaching. And uh, now currently I'm, uh, I'm doing a lot of things right now. I'm uh, having my theater and I'm taking some of, I started like in um, this year, I started being like, okay, this year I'm gonna actually achieve a lot of things that I love. So I'm just gonna go try some new things. So. I'm uh, trying out uh, dance classes and I'm also like um, also teaching and also taking some other jobs and also very uh, much focused on my theater because we will be coming out with a lot of shows hopefully and uh, hopefully you guys can come and see and you will like it. Hopefully you will like it and uh, yeah. Um, if there is any questions, let me know. And I, I I don't know what else to share, but if you guys curious to know anything about me or anything about uh, the refugee community here, as much as I have the information, I will share it with you guys. But if I if it's something that I really can't share it, but I will let you guys know. Sure.
great, great, great to hear your story, Fazana. And and I have spoken to you before, uh, in uh, last year's uh, refugee festival as well. You were just wonderful in answering those questions, uh, that 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 uh, were very pertinent. Um, somebody was actually very curious online to find out uh, where are you from and what's your mother tongue. Uh, and I'm going to extend this question uh, uh, a little bit further, if I may, uh, so you can let us know about where you are from and what's your mother tongue. And um, I think it would be also nice for the students to hear what has your journey been like moving from where you came from to here and how has that adjustment been for you? Okay. Uh, I'm from Afghanistan and my family is from Afghanistan as well and uh, we both we all uh, speak Dari that's our main language the mother tongue that's Dari uh, or some can say it Farsi as well they're basically the same but different dialogues but yeah Dari is the main and uh, we came here with my family in 2014 we decided to fly to Malaysia. It was everything. I was, uh, I think I was around 10 or 11 years old when we came here. So everything happened so sudden uh, that we all had to leave Afghanistan and take a very far, a fast flight to India. And I remember I, my, we had to leave behind my oldest sister, which is Saleh's wife which uh, like I truly loved Saleh and my sister and I was like always into their house. I was like always excited to go there and they were my favorite humans like in that time. And like, I really loved enjoying and uh, spending time with them. So that time it was like a big hit for me to like be leaving them also. Like it was all of a sudden we were rushing. I remember my dad being like, so stressed my mom being so stressed everybody was mad very upset we had to leave india we had to go to india and then my after a month or so in living in india my dad got a visa and my sisters both older sisters got a visa to come to malaysia but my mom and me my two younger sister and my brother which are we were all under age under 18 so we were under my mom's protection. She couldn't get a visa traveling with this many kids uh, because they would be like, okay, because the only way we could get a visa was to like have a visa where we say we will return back to Afghanistan. That was the only way to get a visa back then. Because if we would say, okay, we are actually trying to run away from Afghanistan and never return, they wouldn't let us go. So. We were like, we were actually gonna return back to Afghanistan. So that's how my dad stayed there with my two sisters for one month. And then we stayed for like three months. It was really hard staying in Malaysia. We were, we were being scammed everywhere here and there. And it was really tough, especially my mom couldn't speak the language. My dad couldn't speak the language. My brothers, sisters, none of them. All we could speak, the only language we could speak was Dairy, and my oldest sister could speak like a little bit English, like a little bit, like some words. We couldn't even like form a sentence together. Then after we managed to come here in Malaysia, and then to be honest, I, we thought that Malaysia is gonna be our second home, like a place where we get to resettle, settle down. We can, our, my mom and dad's hope was like, we are gonna go here, our kids gonna study, like achieve something in life. That was our plan, coming to Malaysia. We came to Malaysia, we realized that, boom, mm. we are people telling us to, oh my God, be careful when you go out, police might cut you, or you don't have proper documents. Uh, you need to register to UNHCR and then get resettled to another country. You can't go to schools here. Like this is a lot, you know, hitting you from everywhere. Like you come to a, like, imagine I, you come to our house and then right when you arrive to our house, we tell you how much 
you should be scared of being in our house. Like, you know that this is not like a house for you to live in. This is not a safe place for you. So we were pretty scared. A lot of things happened the past, uh, the first few years when we were here. A lot of things we faced. A lot of times we got caught by the police and um, there was, it was very tough. None of us could even speak English. We had to look for jobs. And uh, my dad was, uh, my dad is like, uh, he is, I would, I wouldn't say he's a bad person, but he is just like bad tempered and he never really cared about uh, any of us and all. And he was like blaming us for everything. He was like, oh my God, you guys did this. Like um, I had to leave. Afghanistan for you guys and now here I'm doing nothing I can't speak the language and everything so it was a lot of pressure more on my mom and us also from the whole coming to a whole new world for us eating with English with the language with the uh, unknown like we don't we didn't know what was the culture how it was for us like literally it was we came here like with a blind eyes, like we were just like, we had to face everything all together at once. It was really hard. Like even though it's like 11 or 12, I still remember the things that we had to face and things that it was really hard. And uh, yeah, it was, it was all the challenges aside. And then my dad was making things even worse for us and uh, a lot happened uh, during that time and my sisters were also an underage and uh, working with the documents that were not accepted and one of my sisters uh, was working in this uh, in this uh, sh shop it was, it was a toy shop like kids toys shop and then she was caught by police because she didn't document proper document and for about six months she was in Siminia camp it was re like really hard times it was like first few years when we came here all of these things suddenly hit us and like my sister got caught and we didn't know she, where she was in 14 days like this is something we didn't know about Malaysia rules also like you can't have visitors until 14 days you can't visit that person and uh, it was really tough that time. Uh, and now sometimes when we hear somebody new coming to Malaysia, some Afghan, they're new or whatever, we try to like help them out. We try to like not really scare them because at that time people like terrified us of telling us everything. Like there are sometimes uh, giving somebody, somebody the bad news, it depends on how you tell them also. Sometimes you could make that bad news that feel a little bit better. So we are like always, I always tell my mom, when you see somebody new in Malaysia, even if they're like first few months, I know those months are really hard for everybody. Just try to make it like, just try to make it, them feel a little bit better because that's what we went through. We don't want others to go through it as well. But I think, Things have been improved a lot since the time that we have come here. Like that time, refugees were getting much more hate and uh, much more discrimination than before. Uh, than, and then now, like before they were getting more hate and uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of people knew about it. And those people who knew about it were also discriminating them, judging them and everything. And, this is still going on, but the good thing is there are some activists that speak with uh, that speak for refugees, and there are some refugees that are uh, going out there telling people like because some NGOs here and there's some NGOs here that really shows a bad image of refugees to the people, and uh, for someone let's say for if somebody didn't know what refugee are, like what does refugee mean? They would really have, they would be really terrified of hearing uh, 
from some NGOs that like, they literally promote refugees to get funds and they promote it in a really bad way. Like they'd be like, they're useless. They like, they can't, they really need your help. They can't do this. They're not allowed to work. But then they don't say that, yes, they are talented. You know, like refugees are talented. They are not given, yes, that's right, that they are not given the opportunity of working, but that doesn't mean that they're useless, they can't work. Something that is taken from them doesn't mean that they can't do it. So uh, that's something that I want to like change it to, like I want to talk about it too. So like, I want everybody to know that refugees are just as normal human beings. It's just they're, I feel like refugees are much stronger. I think if you he hear somebody is refugee, you need to, instead of looking down to them, you need to look up to them saying that, oh my God, they have, they had to leave their house to seek for something they need. Like safety is a need for them. They had to leave everything behind to come and to find a better place. And that doesn't make them less human. That doesn't make them useless or anything. Choosing, I think every human choosing their own safety, choosing what they really want to do, it's not bad. Even uh, I, like, I remember uh, somebody asking me like years ago, which I hated being called a refugee. I was like getting hit everywhere, telling me like, everybody treating me a different way when I would say that I'm, I have a unit your card or I'm living here as a refugee to the point where I remember my friend was, uh, my friend Amin had captured a moment of me saying that how much I hate being a refugee and how much I get offended when people tell me about um, being a refugee. So uh, like when I would go to, some talk shows and people come there trying to promote refugees in a bad way. Now get so embarrassed, so embarrassed because I'm a refugee as well. And that's something that is like, I didn't choose to be. And that's a name that it's given to me, but you guys don't even know what does that name mean? You don't know my story. You don't know what, what does a refugee go through, but you judge them. That's something that I would I would be like, sometimes when people even ask me, like, I remember like two years ago, and then like when some would, someone would ask me, where are you from and all that? I would simply answer like a different, quite like different, I would give a different answer. I would either say, oh, I'm just like, I'm just studying here or I'm just like working here. I have like a work visa. I wouldn't even say I'm a refugee because I, would, I was so embarrassed to say I'm a refugee, but this past years I've learned that uh, it's not something that I should be embarrassed of, it's something that I should be proud of because uh, if I didn't choose, if my family didn't choose to become refugees, didn't choose to leave our country for our safety, we would be lay, living in slavery. We would be living in such a bad life. I mean, for us to choose a good life, it's not a shame. There's no embarrassment in there. And I think, yeah, that's something I learned to like embrace. Like, and I, I always uh, look up to a lot of refugee uh, refugees here. A lot of them are really strong. I know a lot of refugees that work really hard here. One of them is Saleh. I really admire Saleh. He, he started the Parasu Theater from zero, literally. And um, the time when we started that, uh, like when I joined there, you know, we didn't have much actors there. Nobody believed that a refugee, Saleh is a refugee as well. So a refugee can have a group of other refugees, which forms like a big theater. Nobody believed that, nobody wanted to see our shows. Even refugees themselves thought it's something like, we had people saying, oh, uh, we had, uh, when we were looking for actors, we had refugees themselves saying, 
we have jobs, we have family to feed. Why would we want to waste our time being in your theater, which is not gonna go anywhere? We are living here as refugees. Nobody cares what a refugee does. Nobody is gonna like value your work because you're a refugee. Like seriously, we have some uh, doctors here that are working in restaurants right now. We have some engineers here that are working in restaurants right now. Like we have some teachers here that are working in shops and stores as sales, salesmen, saleswoman. Like that's how it is here. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is hard for everybody, uh, all refugees here, it doesn't matter from which country they are. Uh, as long as you're not in your home, it is gonna be really uncomfortable being in somebody else's home, especially when it's everybody's judging and all that, and you're trying to prove them that this is not really what it's going on, or this is not really me, this is not my story, this is not what is happening. It is really, it is gonna be hard to prove them, but I always like want to take the challenge. Like sometimes when I talk to some of my friends, they're Malaysians or they're Chinese, they're wherever they're from. When I tell them, uh, when I talk to them, when they ask me about refugees, I tell them all, like I tell them what they go through and also what they know. And like their talent is more important to, tell, to be talked about than what they need or like what are the opportunities that are not given to them. Like, uh, it is important to talk about their skills as well. It's uh, it's not always saying that, oh, refugees, they left their home. They need your help. They need a place to stay. They need a place to get resettled, a country to get resettled, a country to, call, to be called home. Instead, it should be like, oh my God, they're refugees. They were, they're actually talented. They're doctors, they're actors, they're teachers because of the situation that has happened to their home, they left their home. And now it would be nice for us to have them in our house because they're, they're gonna be positive for the future. It's not like they're not doing anything illegal to hurt your country or hurt anyone else here. So of course, everywhere, every country, everywhere have their bad and good humans and um, there's always like that it's just um that you need to you don't have to judge people before getting to know them like you have don't know them like try to get to know them before you say something negative about them. that's something that i always tell a lot of people recently i've been talking to this um this guy actually texted me on uh instagram he he is actually a teacher. He teaches a couple of refugee kids here. He told me, uh, Farzana, I am just teaching them. I don't know much about refugees here. And he was somehow very terrified of meeting refugees here to the point that one day he was like, I don't know how to be around refugees, how to serve refugees. I was like, uh, just think of them as normal humans. You are coming to see a bunch of humans. Yeah. Don't worry, you don't have to carry any sword or anything. You're not meeting a bunch of monsters here. <laughs> just be normal around them. You're meeting a normal people. Just like you go outside shopping, you're not going to, you go outside shopping. How normal is that for you meeting the salesman or saleswoman, right? Or yeah. you go to some, you go and outside in the park, you meet some new people, right? Mm. Just as small as that. It's just that how uh, some people, like give a bad idea of refugees or even some people online give a bad idea of refugees and or post stuff about refugees so I, yeah like nowadays everything is on people believe what they see true like the minute they see something they believe it in that minute and without really understanding what is behind it and trying to figure out what is it so yeah that's why a lot of refugees gets judged here and get discriminated here, which is tough, but uh, 
I'm glad that this year and past year, a lot of refugees have been doing amazing work here. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, my friends and a lot of other people that have like having their own thing going on, either doing arts, doing, um, we have here refugees that teach teaches guitar, they teach art, they teach theater and they teach uh, even barbering and a lot of skills here right now. Like it's a, I think that from this past years where people are starting to speak out about refugees more and show the positive way, it's also like giving refugees a positive uh, vibe or positive energy for them to like show their skills, right? Yeah. And you're in a, in a place where everybody's like giving you bad, band energy like you can't do this you can't do that you need this you have to follow this and all that you're always like you feel like in there you're in a box that you can't get out of it mm. no matter how skilled you are no matter how much you know if somebody tells you if like a group of people are telling you that you can't do it then you will feel that way like you really can't achieve anything and Hazana, I think Hazana, if, if I may uh, just um, <laughs> chap in here a little bit, because I, I want to give some context to the kids about okay. why, uh, you know, your, the, your story is just is, is good. You know, everything that you're saying is coming out from from your experience and everything. And, and I want to tell all the, the, the students here a little bit of context. You see, when, when they are forced to leave their homes and they come to a new place, they are not given the proper documentation for the rights to work, uh, education, and even medicine. Now, if you imagine if let's say you fall sick and if you have to go to a clinic, you don't have the proper documentation. And some of these doctors are actually obliged to go and report um, uh, uh, them to the authorities. So you have to understand that that is also one of the reasons why uh, some some of the people in the community do not want to go and see a doctor if they're sick because they are afraid of getting caught. So uh, the situation is not as hunky-dory as, uh, oh, it's just like a normal human being, you know, you can just walk into any place and all that stuff. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. So, so you, so for for the class here, you have to understand that this is something that whatever Fazana is mentioning to you, it's her story, and it's not only her story, but it is the story of many of the other people that's living in this community as well. Yeah. Uh, Fazana, if if I may, can I ask uh, if there's anybody, uh, maybe Dr. June or maybe Professor Michael, you have any questions you wanna ask Fazana? Because I'm very conscious of time. So I, I want more of your questions to be answered, if that's okay? Yeah, sure, sure. No. Yeah. Dr. June or Professor Michael, you have any questions you want to ask uh, Fazana? Michael, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm muted myself. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting story, Fazana. Uh, but I guess one of the things that I'd be interested in is, um, what sort of problems or challenges do you see for yourself over the next uh, couple of years? Uh, what kind of uh, barriers, um, pitfalls, uh, problems do you anticipate? Um, one of the things, one of the things that that I teach is uh, is planning, whether it's corporate planning, marketing planning, or your own life planning, and. Uh, uh, I often spend a lot of time on something called potential problem analysis, which is kind of looking for things that are like to hit me in the future that I maybe haven't thought about. So are there any particular worries, concerns, pitfalls, barriers that you see coming up that, uh, that could make life more difficult for you in the next couple of years? Uh, well, um... I think uh, living here as a refugee, you basically don't know what is the future for you. Like a lot of refugees 
uh, I'm just gonna give an example. A lot of refugees here uh, doesn't start doing something like some don't go to school, they will start working immediately to the hopes of like, okay, this couple of years, I'm just gonna work here. And then, because I will be settling soon to another country, then when I resettle to that country, I will gonna start my education. That's what my sisters have been planning to do as well. And we have been living in Malaysia for nine years. Imagine nine years of education being crushed like that, like in hopes of getting to another country. Like a lot of some, uh, I'm, I, I am a kind of person that will, if I want to do something, I will immediately do it because I've been encouraged to do it as well. And I, I don't want to wait for some, for like, let's say, I don't want to like be, okay, I'll do this to another country, but it's something that also scares me because I am in Malaysia, I do have my theater, Paris to theater and in here, uh, we are doing very well, like this since 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, like for five years, I've been doing theater. So for me, if I get to resettle to another country, I don't have any document. If I want to start in an art school or if I want to start in a theater group, then I need to start from zero. That's something that bothers me a lot because Theater is really something I love. And if I lose this, or like, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a, I don't know if, I would say waste, but it's not also good to use it that way because this five years I've learned a lot, but then I'll be making, I'll, if I go to another country, I need to start from zero again. If I want to do theater, if I want to get to the level where I am at today, I need to start from zero again because I don't have any proper documentation of like showing, oh, okay, this five years, I've been in this theater group. So that's something that worries me. And that's something that a lot of time I'll be thinking about. And also like Paris too is my family here. Something, all the members, I'm really attached to them. I love working with them and they all. And for me thinking, okay, one day I will go to, let's say I'll get resettled to Australia, but maybe the rest of the members won't resettle to Australia. Maybe our director is settled to another country, different country. So in this way, like Paris two members will just all get separated. That's something that I really am scared of. And I know that something will happen one day, which is really sad. And um, that's what upsets me more. And that's my future. That's what I. Ha that's how I see my future, which is um, really upsetting. And I try to not think of it a lot, but I think that's the reality of it. You know, you never know what is gonna happen to you next, and you cannot plan it. Actually, you cannot plan. Like I can't say, okay, in ten years' time, or in five years' time, I'm just gonna be like a professional teacher or professional uh, theater play actor, because we don't know if by five years time I will be here or will the Paris team be here or maybe our director is not here anymore. So that's something to worry, yeah. Dr. Jun, do you have anything you want to ask? Yes, I have. Uh, Farzana, I've been very privileged to meet you and uh, thanks, Derek, for inviting me probably at the 11.5 hour. Uh, so Farzana, I've been very inspired by your work. For some context, I worked with refugees in the past during some of my studies and it has a very personal mark to my life. Uh, and um, it's been very great to hear you. And what I really learned from your experience of you teaching me today was um, what I learned from the Tennessee Office of Refugees, where they said that um, being a refugee is not a badge, uh, is not a mark of insult, uh, but a badge of strength, courage, and victory. Uh, and that's something that I see in you and the theater that um, I believe with your family you formed. 
So I'm very interested um, that yes, refugees are very skilled. So I've seen people in arts, people in knitting and even our various skills. Um, every refugee, uh, they have so much of courage and strength in them. I just like to know um, what led you to this theater and um, did you start it with, well, you were mentioning that there was no education form of basis. So, so how did you and your family or your brother-in-law go about this? And um, where do you see yourself going uh, through this? Because I'm very excited to see your YouTubes and what you have online, because I have not been, I had the privilege to be at your theater. I'm just one week old in Kuala Lumpur. So yeah, I would like to know more about your theater and what led you and how, how did you form this, uh, the skills and things, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, my director Saleh Sepas have been uh, he's also a journalist he was a journalist in Afghanistan and also he was a theater writer and director in Afghanistan as well when he came here he wanted to he was already doing this work back in Afghanistan with the women in Afghanistan so when he traveled to Malaysia he wanted to do when he saw that the situation in here with the refugees everything so he wanted to form a group with the refugees themselves so where we can perform about the reality of things and then show it to people, bring awareness, also help refugees themselves. And uh, the actors, all of them were not experienced actors. They started all from zero. One of them is me. I was very young at that time and I had no idea about, I, I didn't know anything about acting or so. To the point where I was a very shy person and uh, I couldn't talk to someone directly looking in their face or I was very quiet girl. I never talked to anyone or so for me to the point where uh, when I was like practicing in this theater, everybody had given up on me, everybody like my director. Uh, I heard that somebody somebody told me that my director thinks that, OK, we will need to change Farzana and replace it to somebody else because we don't have much time to left and we had we don't have much time we to our show like we need to it's either she do it properly herself like she really try to change and work hard or we need to replace her and uh our first shows were in Damansar Performing Arts Center and uh a lot of people were shocked by my performance and I was shocked by my performance that how I could do it because uh, even my family thought I couldn't everybody given up on me because I was like a very shy person I couldn't even tell the dialogues properly face to face looking at the actor's face and like uh, yeah I everybody had given up on me and um, I learned a lot and I through this theater and I had a lot of performances. I met a lot of amazing people through this. And um, first of all, at first I didn't love it. Like I liked it. I liked the idea of being an actress, but I didn't love it. I didn't put it as a part of my life. But then after a few performances, I was like, I realized that it's something really I'm good at and I, it's something that I really love and it's something that I see my future doing it. And I want to like, I see my future as like, no matter what comes in between, no matter like what happens or I resettle or anything, I want to like not give up and try my best to one day like be in the big movies and, uh, just like uh, my favorite actress, I call uh, her name is Golshifta Farhani. It's one of my favorite actors. She's amazing. She does a lot of empowering uh, movies. One of her movies were The Patient Stone, which was, um, which uh, that movie was like a bomb. It hit everywhere, and a lot of people were surprised about this movie. It was really good movie, and it's. And I love her and I do really want to like, she also faced a lot of problems because she is from Iran and being Iran, you cannot uh, have those type of like opportunities to being in the arts as well. So I feel like uh, I look at her as my role model and I do really want to like 
get into the level I'm like in movies and streaming and I hopefully I can win some prizes in the future. <laughs> yeah, maybe that. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> I will win later. <laughs> very, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we still have about eight minutes left. Does any one of the students wants to ask any questions before we uh, come to a close? Uh, Fazana, while we're waiting for the students, um, are, uh, are the students uh, okay to uh, contact you if they have any questions uh, going further? If let's say they want to ask you anything, do you, do, do you have a contact that we could uh, contact you if that's, if that's possible? Or an email. You're muted, Fazana. You're mute. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. There's uh, there's my Instagram and there's my phone number and email as well. You can contact them all. It's okay. Okay. I'm, all right. I'll be. So it's fine. Yeah. Uh, you can. Should I leave it in the chat box? Yeah. No? Yeah. I think leave it in the chat box. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. Me and yeah, no worries. Um, so, so um, I think I think what you have shared so far has been really awesome. Um, obviously, we can spend a lot more time talking to you, getting to know you. I, I think the the main inspiring message here that you have mentioned is that all of us are humans at the end of the day, and all of us have the right to live, to work, to education. Uh, to to all the basic necessities, okay? It's just, I mean, for me, it's it's basically um, everyone has talent and everyone has something to give back to wherever they are at the at the present moment, and uh, um, and I and I know that it's not impossible for us to go back to the to the a basic decency of looking at everybody as just a normal human being, right? Because I have met your brother-in-law, obviously. <laughs> I have met your sister as well. And I remember meeting your sister. She was actually, and you did say that she doesn't speak English that very well. She actually reached out to me during one of the conventions uh, in one of the conferences and she sat down with me and she tried to have a conversation with me and I felt so honored. Okay, yeah, Musuma. <laughs> and it was so, it was, it was so, I, I don't know how to put it this way. For a person who doesn't even know the language trying to reach out to, to, to me, I feel embarrassed because I did not do the same thing uh, in other instances, you know, when I can speak the language and I don't get to know other people as well, you know, that to me is what I think Dr. June mentioned it very well. You don't wear that label with shame, but you wear that label with the strength of, as a badge of honor. And that's how I feel uh, uh, the, the whole community represents. If there's one word, it's bravery. Yeah, if there's one word that the community represents, that's bravery, because it's not easy. Okay. Does anybody uh, in the uh, uh, students who wants to ask any questions? Oh, okay. Uh, who is that? Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yes, Michael. They, 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 they are very, very shy. So you have Fazana's Instagram and you have Fazana's uh, email. So please take it down. If you have any questions, please talk to her personally. Okay, maybe not in an open space. But Fazana, before we go, because we only have a few minutes left, I want you to tell us if you have any last, last minute, uh, last things you want to tell the young people in this country, especially because some of these students are about your age, and some of them are actually a bit older. Okay, they some one person actually said that they admire you for being such a young age, going through so many things. Um, they want to know if you have uh, anything that you can inspire these young people uh, moving forward? I think um, no matter what, uh, everybody should believe. Uh, this is what everybody should keep telling themselves. No matter what the society tells you, no matter how much the society brings you down, just 
do what you feel that is right for you and do what you think that it's as long as you're not hurting anybody then it's you you know so it's sometimes you might think that oh with this decision i am hurting this person but as long as you're satisfied with what you're doing and you think that it's the right thing to do i think nobody should be able to stop you and you shouldn't stop because people are telling you and um that's something that will let you achieve a lot of things in life not just uh like not just in your school or whatever, it will help you a lot in life, no matter what, because we are always living in a society that will constantly gonna judge us, that are constantly gonna tell us that we can't do some, some things or maybe for them, it, those things are not proper. But as long as you know, and that's what your heart tells you, that it's the right thing, just go for it. Never wait for us, to, never wait never wait okay i'm just gonna do this for like next year or this year maybe this things gets better in the next year no just do it because uh some we will not regret anything else but wasting time that's something we will all regret oh my god i wish i should have done that yesterday so much time have been wasted that's the only thing that will goes in out like can go out of our life and we're gonna regret it the most yeah so just don't waste your time do what you want to do at that moment and don't listen to what society always tells you like don't don't take the negative stuff yeah that's it <laughs> thank you so much uh since Prof. Michael is here, do you have any last things you want to say uh, just to close off the whole thing? Uh, well, that was uh, an excellent exposition, Fazana. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, thanks for the uh, cho choreography, Professor Ong. Uh, and uh, just as a, a side note to uh, all the students, just to reiterate on questions, uh, it's always good to ask questions. Uh, you find out a lot more interesting things about people and their problems and uh, um, issues that you may not be aware of. So asking open-ended questions is very useful. Uh, you need to get into the habit of always having three questions to ask. Uh, and I've mentioned this in the chat box. Uh, the danger with only having one question ready and prepared is that somebody else might ask it and then if the lecturer, you know, some evil person like me, uh, puts you on the spot, uh, you need to have a question ready to go. And if somebody's already asked it, then you're in trouble. Uh, the danger is that uh, the question you want to ask somebody like Fazana, she may answer on pass on somewhere else. So your second question is gone. So always make sure you've got three questions. You're going to have to be pretty unlucky to have three good questions ready and not be able to use one of them. So uh, try and think about that. It, it's nearly always going to happen. Well, it will happen to you in life all the time. So uh, you need to get into the habit of doing it now. Uh, I'd like to thank June for her contribution too. And uh, I guess I'll see all the rest of you uh, next week. Uh, have a good uh, long weekend. I believe it's uh, uh, Vesak Day on uh, Monday. So uh, have a good break and uh, I'll see you around. Ciao. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fazana, and, and congratulations once again. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so sad that I will not be able to attend. <laughs> <laughs> everybody yeah. will be. My congratulations. Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Take care, everybody, and goodbye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. -bye. Bye.